It was a brisk autumn evening in 1905 when Stuart Pearson, a Kenyan college student, found himself in the midst of a secret initiation ceremony. Pearson had been tentatively accepted into a fraternity, but before he could become an official member, he would first have to endure a night of hazing as part of his initiation. He stood in the woods with other pledges surrounded by cloaked figures who were softly chanting. And while the other pledges were frightened, Stuart knew most of the cloaked figures. He was pledging the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity, the same frat that his father pledged decades before. And this was the beginning of his initiation. What was supposed to be one of the happiest nights of Stuart's life soon turned deadly. Today we look at the hauntings of Stuart Pearson and the tragic events that occurred before and after his demise. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. The cloaked figures of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity stood chanting. Stuart looked at each figure, searching for any sign of his father beneath the dark robes, but all he could see was their warm breath as it met the cool autumn air. Suddenly, the figures sprang toward the pledges, throwing burlap sacks over the boys' heads as they were carried away into the woods. Stuart was carried to a train trestle, over the Cocosine River, where he was bound with a rope. Some versions of the story say that he was tied to the tracks. Other versions say he was just bound at his ankles and wrists and laid between the rails. Either way, he was instructed to lie down and wait until his brothers returned for him. Stuart knew that if he wasn't still lying there when they came back, no matter what the excuse, he wouldn't be admitted into the fraternity. But panic started to set in and Stuart struggled to free himself. His efforts were useless and his restraints were too tight. As he lay there, helpless and restrained, he prayed for a miracle to save him from the impending doom that awaited him. Just as he thought his fate was sealed, his father's hand rested gently on his shoulder. Relief washed over him as he heard his father's voice whisper in his ear, reassuring him that the fraternity brothers had checked the train schedule, and there was no train coming that night. Stuart was then left alone on the tracks. Exhausted and emotionally spent, he allowed himself to relax and soon drifted off to sleep. Then Stuart awoke to the train tracks, rumbling beneath him. It had been a quiet Saturday evening at the Cleveland, Akron, and Canton Roundhouse in Mount Vernon. The mechanics who worked there were looking for something to keep them busy, so they decided it would be a good time to call their office in Millersburg and suggest sending up some engines for maintenance. The request was approved, and soon locomotive number 26 set out for Millersburg. It's estimated that the train was cruising along at 50 miles per hour by the time it reached the curve before the bridge. Stewart's watch stopped at 9.41 p.m. When the fraternity brothers returned at 10 p.m., they were met with a gruesome sight. Stewart's mangled body was lying next to the train tracks. He had sensed the oncoming train, struggled to roll clear of the tracks, and got most of his body out of the way. His head had been crushed by the locomotive. Stewart's body was still warm when his fraternity brothers found him. They quickly removed all of the rope from his body and discarded the evidence. Instead of calling the Gambier coroner, College President Dr. William Pierce called a local physician to examine the body, casting suspicion on the investigation. Some claim that the fraternity had intentionally put Stewart in harm's way. 
while others insisted that it was an unfortunate accident. Things took a more suspicious turn when Stewart's father announced that he would be immediately taking his son back to Cincinnati for burial, and he wanted to break the news to his wife himself before she read about it in the papers. Pearson arranged for a special train to transport his son's body home before dawn, The college president neglected to inform the police about his departure until after the train had already left, along with Stewart's remains and any potential clues that could have helped with the investigation. The morning after the tragic event on the railroad trestle, the evidence of the horror was all too apparent. While the town was still asleep, a group of students were deputized by Dr. Pierce to clean up the blood and remains from the bridge. Once the gruesome cleanup was completed, Dr. Pierce contacted the local authorities and informed them of what had happened on the trestle. The news was shocking, and the authorities began to investigate immediately. Both the Knox County coroner and prosecutor were anything but pleased with how the situation had been handled. The delay in informing them was unacceptable, and to make matters worse, The body of the victim had already been taken out of the county and the crime scene had been cleaned up. The coroner wasted no time and immediately boarded a train to Cincinnati to conduct his own examination of the body. Knox County officials also wired the Cincinnati police, requesting their assistance in the investigation. Upon their arrival in Cincinnati, the officials headed straight to the Pearson family home in College Hill. However, their initial impressions were far from satisfactory, and their frustrations only grew as they began to investigate the circumstances surrounding Stewart's death. The tension between President Pierce and investigating officials grew as they disagreed on the cause of Stewart's death. Ligature marks on Stewart suggested he might have been bound, a theory supported by some newspapers and a witness who saw Stewart restrained and led to the tracks. President Pierce, however, dismissed these claims, insisting Stewart died accidentally and rejected the idea of foul play. This resulted in conflicting newspaper headlines, with some highlighting a ghastly crime and others featuring Pierce's denial of any wrongdoing. Despite the anger and frustration of the Knox County officials, Stuart Pearson's father issued a statement in the newspaper, absolving the college and fraternity of any wrongdoing and assisting his son was not tied to the tracks. Finally, on the morning of November 11, 1905, the county coroner announced his final ruling. The testimony establishes beyond a question of doubt that Stuart L. Pearson was lying about 20 feet west of the abutment between the rails of the main track of the C.A. and C. Railway Company, west of Gambier Station. From the condition of the body of the said Stuart Pearson, which I examined after the same had been sent out of Knox County to Cincinnati, and from which examination I found evidence of having been bound or tied at the wrist and at the ankles, and which, in conjunction with all of the evidence adduced, I find, therefore, that the said Stuart Pearson was either tied fast to the railroad track, or railroad ties, or otherwise bound and tied in such a manner that he could not extricate himself from his perilous position. And while so tied or bound in that manner, was run over by an engine and tender going west on said railroad, which struck him while lying flat between the rails of the main track on said bridge, and in that manner met his death. Although officials were displeased with the mishandling of the scene, they chose not to hold the fraternity or college legally responsible possibly believing that the fraternity's own sense of guilt was sufficient punishment. Delta Kappa Epsilon, a prominent fraternity with influential members including President Theodore Roosevelt, was unlikely to be held accountable for Pearson's death. 
Kenyon College faced severe challenges due to the scandal surrounding Pearson's death, with enrollment dropping significantly. The college, with fewer than 150 students, was struggling to cope with the negative publicity. However, the situation was somewhat alleviated by the college's influential alumni, who spearheaded a letter-writing campaign to media outlets. They defended the college and fraternity, attempting to redirect the blame from these institutions to the local authorities, whom they accused of unfairly targeting them. The truth remains elusive even today, and the mystery of what really happened to Stuart Pearson on that fateful night in 1905 continues to intrigue and captivate those who study the case. In the aftermath of the accident, a phenomenon emerged. Sightings of Pearson's ghost. It seems that Stuart roams the bike path where the train tracks once stood. But it's worth noting that the West Wing bullseye window at Old Kenyon appears to be the center of tragic events, and Stuart's spirit is most often glimpsed there. In all probability, his father was waiting for him at the Kenyon bullseye when the train hit, and it's also where Stuart spoke his last words to his father, saying, Good night, Pop. I'll see you after a while. The legend surrounding Pearson is so strong that many of his students avoid his old dorm room on the anniversary of his death. However, John Hepp, a student who graduated in 2004, was not deterred by the haunting stories and decided to spend a night in Pearson's infamous room. Before he entered the room, Hepp went out with his friends for the evening. But when he returned that night, he found the bullseye window wide open. Hepp knew that this window was notoriously difficult to open and couldn't have been opened by the wind alone. He couldn't help but wonder if the ghost of Stuart Pearson was trying to make his presence known. Hepp was lying in bed and suddenly felt a chilling sensation on the back of his neck. He turned to find an empty room. Confused and curious, he got up to investigate. That's when he noticed a lock on a small door inside the closet was unhinged. Intrigued, he opened the door and peered inside, discovering a small crawl space. As he shone his flashlight around the space, he spotted some Delta Kappa Epsilon memorabilia, pledge books, and other trinkets. But one item stood out to him the most, a particular engraving with the initials SLP and the date of 1905. Hep realized that he had stumbled upon a piece of history. Countless signatures of former students adorned the walls of the crawl space, and he felt a sense of awe and wonder wash over him. This hidden room had been a place for secret gatherings and memories for over a century, and now Hep was part of its story. Stuart Pearson's ghost is not confined to just his old dorm room or the train tracks where he met his demise. Many students and faculty have reported seeing his apparition wandering the campus. But he is not alone in his spectral journey. The campus is also home to several other spirits, and the old Kenyon building seems to be the centerpiece of the hauntings. But that, my friends, is another story. Thank you for watching, folks. We'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care.